Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar program. Well, the kids have been back at school for now at least over a month, and that can mean only one thing, right? Cold and flu season right around the corner. And that's why we at ISSA have scheduled today's program, which is intended to provide you with a comprehensive strategy for preventing the transmission of the cold and flu. Today's session is presented to you by the NIOSH Office of Total Worker Health, which of course emanates from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The Total, health, Total Worker Health Program explores opportunities to not only protect workers, but also advance their health and well-being by targeting the conditions of work. And ISSA is a proud participant in the TWH Affiliate Program. In addition, we at ISSA are delighted and honored to be the host of today's program. For those of you not familiar with us, we at ISSA are the Worldwide Association for the Commercial Cleaning Industry. And we now represent over 7,000 companies worldwide, which includes manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, and cleaning service providers. And of course, we're best known for our annual trade show which is coming up soon. And that, of course, is ISSA Interclean, set to be held in our hometown of Chicago this year over the dates of October 25 to 28. And with more than 700 exhibitors from 25 countries, we're sure you'll find the facility cleaning solutions you need at ISSA Interclean in Chicago this year. If you're interested in getting some more information on this world-class event or registering, please go directly to issa.com slash show. And in case you're wondering who I am, I'm Bill Bollock, Director of Legislative and Environmental Services for ISSA, and I'll not only be moderating today's program, but also helping out as a presenter. But before we begin today's session, I just want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, as it relates to the audio, uh, we strongly encourage you to use the phone lines. A landline is preferred. Simply dial the number you see on your screen, 888-850-4523, and enter the passcode 113834. If you are using your phones to uh, access today's audio portion of the presentation, we ask that you be sure to mute your phone so that no extraneous noise comes across uh, during today's broadcast. You'll notice that we're using a PowerPoint, and we'll be sharing that with you soon via email after today's session. We'll send you a link to the complete PowerPoint, PowerPoint session uh, that we'll be using here today. And again, that'll, that link will be sent to you shortly after today's presentation. Now, today's session will include a question and answer period immediately following the direct presentation. But we encourage you to submit questions anytime during today's session. But we ask that you use our system's chat function to do that. So to submit a question, you're going to want to click on that private tab that's located in the lower left corner of your screen within that chat area. Uh, then double click on Leaders and Assistance. Type your question in the bottom text box. Simply hit Enter, and your question will come across on this end. And of course, we'll collect those questions as, as they come across and address as many as time permits uh, towards the end of uh, today's program. So on to the substance of today's program, cold and flu season, a focus on prevention. Now, today's focus on prevention is, is done and in recognition of the huge impact that the cold and flu have on society. And, and that's largely due to the simple fact that these are some of the most commonly occurring illnesses. For example, uh, adults on average can expect to have two and a half colds per year. And, and depending on the strain, we can expect 5 to 20 percent of the population to, to catch the flu. And in addition to pain and suffering that we experience as a result of the cold or flu, it's also collectively estimated that the common cold and influenza impose a cost on the U.S. economy that approximates over 
$127 billion a year. This huge sum includes the cost of workplace and school absences, presenteeism, sick workers showing up, being less than productive, costs of medical treatment, hospitalization, medicine, parents staying at home to take care of sick children. You add all these up, and we really come up with a substantial cost and burden that just the common cold and, and flu will impose upon us as a society in addition to the pain and suffering. And, and so it's in this context that the importance of prevention can best be appreciated. And, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's my sincere honor and, and pleasure to, to uh, introduce our featured speaker. Oops, and hold me one second. The slides are not cooperating. There we go. Our featured speaker will present to us an infection prevention strategy for colds and influenza. And Dr. Lynn Saholster uh, is joining us. And, and Lynn, I hope you're OK. I understand you had a, a minor traffic accident this morning. Thank you so much for hanging in there and, and joining us this, this morning. But allow me a few, few seconds here to, to give you a proper introduction. Now, Dr. Lynn Saholster brings with her a wealth of experience. She's been with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for almost 20 years now, where she's working as a health scientist in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion within the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. Now, prior to joining the CDC, Dr. Saholster served as an infectious disease epidemiologist for 15 years at the Texas Department of Health. Her current area of expertise focuses on environmental infection control, microbial inactivation, and transmission of infectious diseases. In that capacity, Dr. Saholster advises CDC and other federal and state health agencies, healthcare professionals, and the public on issues concerning environmental cleaning, sterilization and disinfection, healthcare laundry issues, and environmental management of emerging diseases. Of particular note, Dr. Saholster is the coordinator of and contributor to CDC's guidelines for environmental infection control in healthcare facilities. ISSA extends its sincere gratitude to Dr. Saholster and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control for lending their valuable time and expertise to be with us here today. Uh, and on that note, I, I'd like to now gladly turn the microphone over to Dr. Saholster, who will begin today's session. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm hoping I am coming through loud and clear. Um, yes. Let's see if I can get the. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, thank you, Bill, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I want to welcome everybody in our audience today uh, to this uh, this very informative uh, webinar put together. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, influenza and the common colds uh, from, you might say, uh, again, an infection prevention uh, perspective. Uh, I'll focus on some of the things that will help you understand why we do what we do when we are uh, devising an infection prevention strategy. And Bill's part of the program, uh, after I'm finished, will focus on um, some of the things involving cleaning and disinfecting uh, surfaces that you encounter, whether it's in a hospital or an office building or a school, or even even to your homes and, um, and residences. So on that note, let me share with you quickly uh, some of the things I will cover in today's presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, some of the things that are important to strategy preparation depend on uh, having a little bit of knowledge about the viruses uh, that we will be dealing with. So um, we're, I'm going to limit my uh, presentation to influenza viruses and the common cold viruses. Uh, some folks have, have thought maybe norovirus would be good to throw in there, but it's it's a complex topic that um, deserves a webinar all unto itself. And uh, the thing I will 
uh, share with you uh, again um, for the purpose of the um, of the presentation is the chain of infection, and this is a concept that uh, it is it is beautiful in its simplicity, but it is so important to what we do. And what I'm going to do for you is compare and contrast um, how each of these viruses uh, stack up relative to the different links in the chain. We'll get into that when I get to that slide. Once you see how uh, the chain of infection um, bears on the strategy to counteract these two groups of viruses, you'll see how we can develop an infection prevention strategy from that. And then just a few closing thoughts, uh, which will segue into Bill's part of the program. So let's get started with influenza viruses. Now, um, uh, they're commonly known as the flu. And um, one of the things that uh, I know a lot of people ask, so how many cases of influenza do we have every year? And that's a little difficult to, uh, to estimate because, number one, flu is not a typical reportable disease in the US. Um, they may report um, cumulative numbers uh, for, um, say, influenza-like illness. But um, the only way we really do get a, a handle on the magnitude of the season is through uh, those state health departments and uh, contributing partners who provide laboratory specimens for uh, the influenza virus lab to to see if they can culture uh, influenza. And if they do get a, a hit from those cultures, they then identify it either by strain or type. Basically, influenza viruses are envelope viruses, and this is very important uh, a consideration for our strategy. And for influenza, we have primarily uh, three types, uh, A, B, and C, of which types A and B will dominate as seasonal influenza. Type C is um, pretty much a um, subclinical case of uh, influenza. And we don't normally deal with that so much in, um, in our uh, focus on vaccine issues and so forth. The virus is an RNA virus. But the interesting, strata, the interesting characteristic about this virus is its, its genetic material can contain up to 10 segments. And the reassortment of these segments um, through the infections in our population can result in new strains appearing uh, every year. And this is why the influenza vaccine, uh, the formula for that vaccine, tends to differ uh, from year to year. How it is spread, it is primarily through direct contact with the droplets um, as expelled during coughing and sneezing. And while the healthy upon us and the uh, folks who are in the middle age groups and so forth will have flu and get over it, some complications are definitely noted among the infants and the elderly, two groups that have uh, a less than robust immune system. Let's contrast that with colds virus, of which the primary culprit is rhinoviruses and uh, other viruses that have been known to be uh, linked to colds are adenoviruses, um, some other enteroviruses that can also have a, a respiratory component. But basically, uh, rhinoviruses cause over 50% of the cold-like infections. One of the key differences between this group and that of the influenza virus is this, this virus is a non-enveloped virus. That is, the, prion, or the uh, particle you see uh, does not have what we call an envelope. So it is much more, uh, uh, shall we say, resistant virus to some of the chemicals we typically use uh, for cleaning and disinfecting. Not totally resistant, but per, you know, provides more resistance compared to influenza. It is a single-stranded RNA with positive sense. And more recently, uh, rhinoviruses have been uh, identified into three genetically distinct groups, A, B, and C. Uh, their own A, B, and C, not the same as the influenza. But the problem that we find within, with rhinoviruses is that uh, even though there are three groups, there are hundreds of different strains 
of rhinovirus that circulate at any given time. Um, it causes upper respiratory tract infection, otitis media, sinusitis, uh, definitely an upper respiratory infection uh, and uh, in a way that, with the exception of uh, the otitis media, has symptoms that are in common with that of influenza. And like influenza, uh, the major mode of transmission, uh, direct or indirect contact uh, with aerosols, uh, whether uh, they are in the interpersonal space uh, or sometimes those are uh, deposited on the surfaces. So here is the chain of infection. And you can see these are basically it. This is, this is a very beautifully simple thing. In order for infection to occur, we must have these five or six factors or link satisfied. In other words, you must have a virulent pathogen present. <clears throat> you must have enough numbers or an infectious dose of this pathogen. This pathogen must have a portal of exit. So how does it go from one host uh, to leave that host? The point A to point B is the mode of transmission. How does it get from that current host to another host? And when it gets to that current host, what portal of entry are we dealing with? And perhaps this is one of the most important things. Is that host a susceptible host? Because if you are susceptible to a pathogen um, right there, that increases your risk of uh, at some point acquiring an infection due to that pathogen. But if you're not susceptible, um, then your risk uh, is greatly diminished. So when we do the compare and contrast for rhinovirus, uh, again, these are the, these are the uh, chain of infection links, as we had on the previous slide. And then I share in these two columns the different, uh, different uh, features unique to uh, those viruses. And uh, you can see what they have in common and what, are, what things are different. For, for example, influenza virus is seasonal, but it predominates primarily in the winter. But from one year to the next, uh, the season could start as early in, as early fall, and it could run until uh, into spring. So there is some variability, but it is definitely a fall, winter, early spring virus, and it's um, its uh, circulation in the community uh, depends on uh, close contacts with people in their homes uh, or offices. And uh, because of the cold weather, our furnaces are running, it, it results in lower humidity in those spaces. Whereas rhinoviruses are basically um, occurring throughout the year. Uh, they are most common in the spring, summer, and fall, so their numbers are less likely to be noted in the wintertime. However, we do know, uh, based on serology uh, studies, that um, you can have asymptomatic infection with rhinoviruses. Uh, that's a good thing, I guess. But, uh, but here's the problem, too. Um, compared to influenza, uh, rhinovirus has over 100 serotypes so there is a high sequence variability. Uh, influenza has a limited number of strains that circulate each season. So there you can see um, one factor for influenza that makes it beneficial for, uh, for us to have an influenza vaccine. Uh, this precludes the development of a vaccine. And for that matter, we do not have uh, antiviral medications for rhinovirus either. With an infectious dose, both viruses are known to uh, have large number of viruses in their res in the respiratory secretions. Um, when the virus is uh, released from an infected person, it's usually through the nose and mouth uh, with coughing and sneezing. And as we said earlier, the direct contact with droplets, indirect contact with fomites which are surfaces or devices or uh, sun inanimate object uh, for both of them. And then here's where we get uh, one major difference is the susceptible host. So for influenza, if you are not vaccinated, yes, you can be susceptible. Uh, if you are vaccinated, uh, you will be uh, immune 
to the current strain circulating for that season. With rhinovirus, uh, since we have no antiviral or vaccines, uh, the answer to this is yes, virtually universal in, uh, susceptibility uh, for rhinoviruses. With the portal of entry, uh, this is an interesting thing. With influenza, we can have, uh, uh, if the virus on droplets make contact with the mucous membranes of your nose, your eyes, or the mouth, uh, that is sufficient as a portal of entry for influenza, whereas with rhinovirus, those portals of entry are primarily the mucous membranes of the nose and, and the eyes. So uh, one of the things that uh, is important is, again, these are, these are all structures that are primarily on our face. So one thing that you can keep in mind is that it's important during flu season and, and whenever you have um, a rhinovirus or a common cold infection is to be aware how frequently we touch our eyes, our nose, our mouth. Uh, one study. Uh, in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health uh, with volunteers showed that uh, we tend to touch our, our face at least 15 times an hour. So uh, this is an important thing. And with these two groups of, of viruses, this is what we're dealing with. This is the, uh, the mechanism where large numbers of these viruses can be expelled into, uh, into our uh, interpersonal spaces. And uh, so for that, CDC uh, many, uh, a few years ago had developed the, uh, the shall we say, the information uh, uh, packet called Cover Your Cough, which was part of the larger, uh, larger cough etiquette. You may have seen that or heard about that uh, from the CDC website. So again, um, you can be uh, immune to the stuff in that, that sneeze or cough. It's probably a sneeze with this individual if you have uh, been vaccinated. And just to mention uh, a, a brief word about the vaccine, uh, typically uh, most people will be receiving the trivalent vaccine, which has two strains of influenza A and one strain of influenza B. But if you are above, say, age 60 or thereabouts or have underlying immune, uh, immune problems, your doctor may recommend that you have the quadrivalent uh, vaccine, which has the same two A's and the same B, but adds an additional influenza B strain as well. If you are interested, you can uh, go to the CDC website for um, looking at the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, the MMWR, and look for recommendations in report uh, number five in volume 65, which was released on August 26, uh, 2016. And it will give you all the current information about the vaccine, its indications for use, and uh, everything you need to know for protecting yourself during the flu season. As a, as a segue uh, into some of Bill's area, but also to, uh, again, point out the fact that um, even though the contact with droplets is the most important problem we, we encounter, some of those droplets do settle out of the airspace and will make contact with uh, hard surfaces, porous surfaces, and whatever. And so um, although this slide was originally developed for a, a more clinical setting, uh, person A versus person B uh, might have uh, a spread of influenza from, uh, from the hands of coworkers or classmates or uh, uh, clinicians and so forth. Uh, think of this and this as basically the environmental surface uh, aspects. So if influenza or rhinoviruses do uh, drop to the surface, they can remain active for a certain period of time. Uh, for example, rhinovirus uh, can remain active for several hours to several days on, on hard surfaces. 
and influenza can remain active as well for a few days. It's not as, as hardy as rhinovirus, and so therefore we wouldn't expect it to uh, l linger on surfaces actively very long. But these are the important parts of uh, cough etiquette that I, again, want to uh, share. And again, since we know that the uh, spread of droplets is probably the most important uh, thing to protect yourself against if you're not vaccinated, certainly you would be uh, well served to use tissues to cover your nose and mouth during coughing and sneezing. Uh, if a tissue is not available or a handkerchief or something, sneezing or coughing into your sleeve or elbow is the next best thing. In some circumstances, if you are sick, and again, it depends on the circumstances, uh, you might be asked to wear a mask so that you can help spread, minimize the spread of respiratory secretions to others. But probably the most important thing uh, Second to preventing the release of droplets from your coughs or sneeze, sneezes is to wash your hands frequently. Um, certainly, I think washing with soap and water is probably one of the, the best methods we have currently today, although alcohol hand rubs uh, certainly can be useful, especially against influenza, and they may be slightly less effective against rhinoviruses. But if this is what you've got, it will still be better than doing nothing. And as I say, since we touch our face some 15 times an hour, having clean hands is important. So why do we put a lot of emphasis on hand hygiene? Well, it's because for many of the pathogens we encounter in our lives, uh, the transferal of pathogens on your hands to another surface or another person is probably one of the most common ways that we spread uh, germs from one to another. It's certainly very important in healthcare. And although uh, we're, we're not dealing with, in this case, antibiotic-resistant microorganisms, certainly in that realm, hand washing and use of alcohol hand rubs is very important to minimize the spread of resistant organisms. So uh, basically, I think what I want to uh, kind of summarize uh, before we get into this next little segment is with infection prevention strategy development, what I try to encourage people to do is if there is a means to protect yourself with, say, a vaccination or, the, or taking, say, after the fact, an antiviral, if it is available, by all means, um, look into that. We certainly do encourage vaccination because uh, it is one of the uh, most effective prevention measures we can use primarily against influenza. But secondarily, when it comes to infection control uh, steps or processes, what I like to tell people is, you know, you are, you are better, uh, better served if you can throw a lot of your energy into the things over which you have control. And for me, that means your hands. So if you can really take an aggressive, uh, shall we say, strategy for doing good hand washing throughout the colds and influenza season, that will be coupled with vaccination, the two most important things you can do to protect yourself. Now, since we get into the notion of uh, virus particles and droplets that settle onto surfaces, we will uh, kind of help segue into Bill's section. But I want to point out that um, there is an incredible amount of benefit that can be gained whenever, and even though uh, this says instrument reprocessing, it is also relevant to uh, cleaning of hard surfaces, is indeed the cleaning step. What cleaning is, is basically a physical form of disinfection. And what that does is it removes uh, soil from, uh, from a surface, which in turn will remove uh, several logs of microorganisms from that surface. And cleaning is necessary to enhance the effectiveness of a subsequent disinfection step. And basically, this is all I'm going to say about this subject, because Bill will cover this in more detail. But when you 
look at the basic biophysical and biochemical properties of the virus families, you can uh, are, are better guided to selecting the appropriate disinfectant uh, if you desire to disinfect a surface. Because influenza viruses are envelope viruses, they are very susceptible to a wide variety of the action on uh, several disinfectants. And a, a good, uh, a good uh, shall we say, uh, things to choose from could be quaternary ammonium compounds, bleach, alcohols, hydrogen peroxide. Um, it is susceptible to all, virtually all of the groups that make up what we call low-level disinfectants. Rhinovirus, because it is non-envelope, may require uh, a little bit more strength in the disinfectant you use. Um, again, you certainly are better protected in the sense of hand washing to keep your hands clean is probably one of the most important things. But certainly, sometimes uh, bleach or hydrogen peroxide is a possibility for use, especially in healthcare. We need do nothing different than what we currently recommend for either uh, schools, offices, or uh, healthcare facilities: uh, cleaning uh, and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces with low-level disinfection is usually usually indicated. And one thing we can also recommend that you do is. Uh, sometimes you will see on your disinfectant product uh, label claims for uh, pathogens that the manufacturer has determined can be inactivated by their product. So take a look at that. And also, we would strongly recommend that you follow the use instructions so that you clearly get the most benefit from the disinfect, uh, disinfectant that you choose. And I just want to close my section with this one quote from uh, a uh, colleague of mine from, uh, from Europe. This is only to point out that uh, using disinfectants is only one part of a, of a multimodal strategy. And certainly what I wanted to share with you were some of those things that are, uh, are supporting of, but not, uh, not totally eliminating the use of cleaning and disinfecting. And that is, again, taking advantage of uh, vaccination when available and uh, covering coughs and sneezes to minimize dispersion of infected droplets and washing your hands. But you can see all of these, uh, in some total, are important to maintaining uh, good public health during the colds and flu season. And with that, I will. Uh, finish my part of the program and turn that back over to Bill. Take it away. Thank you so much, Lynn. We're having a little problem moving the slides here today. What's the oh, slider? Maybe I can do that for you. There you go. I've got you on the screen. Thank, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, it, it, that was a wonderful presentation, and I'm glad to hear you're OK. I understand you were in a bit of an accident this morning. Uh, I was. <laughs> Uh, thank you for persevering and, and joining us and, and making a wonderful presentation. Uh, while we're transitioning speakers, I do want to take the opportunity to remind people uh, that we will be addressing questions at the end of this direct presentation. And, and to submit questions, uh, first of all, we encourage you to submit them at any time, but you'll need to do so by using the, <coughs> the chat area in the lower left hand of your screen. Down there, you're going to need to click on the private tab. Then double click on leaders and assistance. And then type your question in that bottom text box, hit enter, and your questions will come across uh, at our end. And again, we'll address as many as time permits. Uh, over the next uh, remaining 10 minutes or so, I, I, I'd like to, as Lynn suggested, focus on the critical role of uh, that cleaning, disinfection, and, and hygiene, hand hygiene play in preventing the transmission of, of cold and, and influenza. Uh, it, as Lynn suggested, it, it really is a numbers game. Uh, why cleaning disinfection and hand hygiene are so important is they, in effect, can significantly reduce the amount of germs and other environmental pathogens that are either on the environmental surfaces that we touch or on our hands. And by reducing those number of pathogens, we thereby reduce 
the risk of transmitting uh, the infectious disease. And of course, today we're talking about the cold and influenza. Now, over the next several slides, I'll be talking, as you can see, about cleaning, disinfection, and hand hygiene. What I do want you to know is that I'll be borrowing heavily. In other words, this material is derived largely from the guidelines published by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, that they have published on cleaning and disinfecting schools to help slow the spread of flu. And you can find those guidelines on the CDC website. Let's move forward. So let, let's take a look at some of these helpful tips and how cleaning and disinfection can specifically uh, reduce the risk of transmitting the cold and flu. Um, and as Lynn suggested earlier, do, do not underestimate the power of just simply cleaning. Cleaning removes the dirt, the soil, the detritus. And it's this material, the dirt and soil, where the germs, viruses, and harmful pathogens are harbored. So in, in cleaning and removing that dirt and soil, we're also removing a good amount of the germs, viruses, and other bad stuff uh, that's on that surface. But as you all probably well know, cleaning itself in most cases is a necessary first step to proper disinfection. So we need to clean, and we need to clean properly. In, in the case of disinfection, you need to clean before you disinfect to remove soil and, and other detritus that would, in effect, make ineffective the disinfectant. So cleaning, often an important first step in disinfection. But speaking of disinfection, we want to limit it. We want to focus it where it can provide us the proverbial biggest bang for our buck. So when cleaning and disinfecting, we want to concentrate those efforts on what Lynn referred to as frequently touched surfaces. So uh, in an office space, school, or, or, or other institutional setting, this often includes surfaces such as desks, countertops, doorknobs, handrails, stair rails, faucet handles. These frequently touched environmental surfaces are one significant way in which these germs are passed, passed on. So we want to at least clean and disinfect these surfaces at least once a day. And you're probably going to want to bump that frequency up uh, when there is reason to believe an outbreak is on the horizon, such as cold and flu season. And of course, as we know, under the, the bloodborne pathogen standard, that's an OSHA standard, that we need to clean and disinfect surfaces immediately that are visibly soiled with bodily fluids, such as blood and so on. I want to emphasize the, the, the importance of routine scheduled cleaning and disinfection. As, as Dr. Saholster had mentioned earlier, the cold and flu viruses are relatively fragile. And, and all we're really trying to say is that it's, if you have a good routine cleaning and disinfection program, it will not be necessary to, to, to panic clean, so to speak, to shut down a facility, uh, inconvenience everybody, put people out of work, students out of school, uh, in order to clean and disinfect. No standard or routine cleaning done at a frequency that's appropriate for the facility and the amount of occupants in there is more than sufficient. So we don't have to bring in the heavy artillery. We don't need to fumigate. We don't need to wipe down ceilings. We just need to do good, basic routine cleaning and disinfection, again, at frequencies that are appropriate for the facility and, and the number of occupants. But we want to do it right. Just like anything, when cleaning and disinfecting, you need to do it correctly, right? Same thing with lifting heavy boxes and things like that. There's a right way. There's a wrong way. And we need to focus on the basics. So whether we're cleaning or disinfecting, we need to pay attention to those labeled di directions. For example, directions related to how to properly dilute a cleaner. You know, we all think more is better. But in fact, more is not better when it comes to uh, di diluting cleaning products. Those dilution ratios are, are scientifically based and are there to ensure the greatest efficacy of the product. So any deviation from them putting in less or putting in more is going to create a product that is not as efficacious, that is not as effective as it would be if you're following those labeled directions. Now, in the case of disinfectants, 
it's especially important that you follow the directions. In fact, it is federal law. Federal law requires users of disinfectants to use them in a manner consistent with those directions. And federal law requires that because it recognizes that if we do not follow the directions on that disinfectant, we might as well not even use that product because it will not be effective. It will not kill as many of those harmful germs and environmental pathogens as it can if used as directed. So pay attention, especially important, on disinfectants. And within the directions on the disinfectant, what we find to be the most important is to pay special attention to things like the dwell time. And that's the amount of time that surface must remain wet with that disinfectant in order for it, the disinfectant, to do its job. Now, many, many products call for 10 minutes. Fairly long time, especially in the world of cleaning. But uh, coming onto the market are many new disinfectants that have shorter dwell times. You may wish to inquire of your vendors or suppliers about these products, but of course, be sure that whatever disinfectant you're using is EPA registered as appropriate for the use against the cold and flu. That information will be on the back of the can, but you can also inquire of your vendor. And another important instruction or direction on disinfectants will be the instruction to clean before it disinfect. And that's, again, a, a necessary uh, 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 item to, to do because it will ensure that that disinfectant is effective at, at its intended purpose, killing germs. That said, I will uh, take notice that there are disinfectants on the market. They're very good products. They're single-step disinfectants. You don't have to clean before disinfecting. You simply spray once, wipe, leave it on there for the appropriate dwell time, let the product do its job. After the dwell time, wipe it up. These products, however, should generally just be used if that surface is not visibly dirty. Okay. You also want to clean and disinfect with safety in mind. Uh, in the case of sensitive electronic equipment, phones, computers, instead of spraying a disinfectant on it, consider disinfectant wipes, which will not uh, place as much liquid on that product, which might ultimately be harmful. Also be careful to read that label of disinfectants that you may be using on certain delicate equipment, sensitive equipment, to make sure that it is the product is compatible with the surface with which you wish to clean. And always, always use products safely. In fact, OSHA's hazard communication standard makes it the law. It requires uh, those who are providing the cleaning service to ensure that their employees are trained in the correct and safe use of those cleaning products. And so what this entails or what it, it, it requires one to do in providing this training is to review the labels, the safety data sheets to identify the known hazards associated with the use of these products, uh, and more importantly, both label and safety data sheet will also provide precautionary measures, in other words, practices, work practices to follow that will help that worker avoid the hazards associated with that product. Now, those precautionary measures may include fairly common things like using appropriate personal protective equipment, such as protective eye goggles or gloves. Uh, always <clears throat> be sure to instruct your workers to use those products in a manner consistent with the label, which also includes or means that workers should not be mixing different chemical products together because that can create an unsafe condition. Common example, mixing bleach and ammonia can create noxious fumes and actually has been known to kill people. So again, do not mix products that are not intended to be mixed together. And 
when providing this training, it is critical, it is important to not just provide them with this information, but really, truly make sure that your workers understand it, and more importantly, that they follow these work practices so that they work safely and can be much more efficient as part of your front line of defense in preventing the transmission of the cold and flu. So that was my little spiel, if you would, about how cleaning and disinfecting hard surfaces can help reduce the amount of environmental pathogens on those surfaces and thereby reduce the, the risk of, of transmitting the cold and flu. But as Dr. Saholster stressed, hand hygiene is critical to preventing the transmission of the cold and flu. Uh, it has been shown, for example, that good hand hygiene can reduce respiratory illnesses like the cold and flu in the general population by over 20%. And, and if we look at other diseases it, uh, like diarrhea, it can reduce the incidence of that disease by 31%. So it has been demonstrated. And again, why it works, why good hand cleaning works, or hand washing, <coughs> excuse me, is because we're significantly reducing the number of germs, viruses, and other harmful pathogens on the, uh, on the surface of the hands, which as we now know, is, a, is the most significant way that these diseases are passed. And so if we, again, it's a numbers game. If we can lower those numbers of germs, viruses, pathogens on the hand, we can likewise significantly reduce the, the transmission of these diseases. So again, let, let's start with the basics. When to wash hands. Uh, simple stuff, folks. After blowing your nose, coughing, sneezing, absolutely, positively, wash hands. Uh, after visiting the bathroom, before and after preparing food, before you eat, after you eat, taking care of someone sick, be sure you wash your hands prior to and after taking care of them. You got kids at home, after changing their diapers or cleaning up the child, uh, or, or before and after treating a cutter wound. It's just good practice to frequently wash your hands, and, and certainly there are key events such as those that I've mentioned that should trigger in you and, and the people you work with the need to wash hands thoroughly. Because I can't stress enough, first of all, uh, there's a significant number of people who simply don't wash hands. And, and honestly, doctors are probably the worst, uh, as done by various hospital studies. It's been very hard to get anybody to wash hands. And when we do get people to wash hands, they're not washing them in the correct manner. A study out of University of Michigan showed that over 90% of people observed washing their hands. We're not doing it correctly. We're not doing it long enough. We're not using soap, uh, and so on. So yes, while it might seem basic and simple, let's review those basic steps on how to properly wash your hands and thereby significantly reduce the pathogens on there. So you want to wet your hands with clean running water. And that's important because just a simple act of running water over your hands is going to remove some of those germs. And the mechanical action of lathering your hands with soap, rubbing them together. Be sure to, be sure to cover or lather the backs of hands in between fingers, under nails. You want to do it as thoroughly as possible and for at least 20 seconds. That mechanical action of lathering your hands followed by rinsing well while rubbing them underwater will remove a significant amount of pathogens but you've got to remember to dry them thoroughly, because if you forget to do that, we start the problem all back over again. Dr. Soholster had mentioned hand sanitizers, uh, and, and I'll just likewise say they are an important tool in our tool chest of, of preventing cold and flu transmission. But typically, these hand sanitizers should generally be used when soap and running water are, are not available for hand washing. Um, of course, there, there are other steps that, that employers can take uh, that are more or less outside of the realm of, of, of cleaning, uh, but yet are good suggestions as part of an overall comprehensive strategy that does include cleaning, disinfection, and hand hygiene. 
Certainly there are other things employers can do to help reduce the transmission of, of cold and flu and, and other diseases at the workplace. Things such as encouraging sick workers to stay at home, having that incorporated into your work policy. For workers and others within your facility, provide the resources as well as an environment that, that promotes personal hygiene by making available uh, tissues, no-touch trash cans, hand soap in areas to, to hand wash, hand sanitizers for those areas that are employees who may not have access to, to soap and running water. Uh, encouraging in different ways uh, your employees to wash their hands frequently. Flu vaccinations, extremely important. Uh, provide some type of encouragement for your employees uh, to ensure that they are likewise vaccinated so that they are immune to the, uh, the current strain of the influenza virus. Um, that pretty much concludes the, the direct presentation and, and, and my comments. And uh, now we're going to uh, go to the question and answer section of our, our session here today. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got a few questions that have come across. And, and Lynn, I'm, I'm going to direct these uh, at least first question to you. So uh, please make sure you're, you're off mute or unmuted. I am here. Okay, great, Lynn. And, and Lynn, can you talk a little bit about the killing time for disinfectants and chemicals and, and why it's important for that dwell time, during that dwell time that the product remain wet on that surface? Well, I think the perhaps the, the easiest explanation for this is um, everything takes time. And that is also true for bacteria and viruses because uh, each of these pathogenic groups, uh, their, their members all have different structures and chemistries. Um, for example, a non-envelope virus, one of the reasons why it is a little bit more resistant to the action of disinfectants and other, other chemicals is its outer surface is primarily a protein or a group of proteins. And uh, protein tends to be hydrophilic. It likes waters and so forth. But uh, many of our chemicals that we use in disinfectants are hydrophobic. Uh, they are organic in nature, and so it takes a little bit of takes more time for um, many many disinfectant active ingredients to permeate and infuse into the particle to a point where it reaches a shall we say a target a target for its activity. And um, with the envelope viruses, the dwell time for those viruses will probably be shorter because. The envelope is a lipid-containing uh, structure of that virus, and that's on the outside. And the old adage in organic chemistry was likes dissolve likes. And so in this case, if you have an organic uh, chemical, uh, perhaps such as a quaternary ammonium compound, that will be able to permeate uh, influenza viruses more quickly and more easily because it can dissolve the lipid components of the envelope out and gain access to the inner structures of those of those viruses. So that's that's a little bit about why the dwell time is so important. If you remove a disinfectant before it's had adequate time to permeate the pathogens you want to treat, uh, you'll get uh, less than a full uh, component of activity. Thank you, Lynn. Very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our next question is a, a little off subject, but, but a good one. Uh, it, it, a little off subject in the sense that it addresses tuberculosis. Okay. Uh, not a topic that we, we handled here today. But um, the question I, I think is an appropriate one for you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you know about TB and how, how it's transmitted and, and how long, if at all, it lives on environmental surfaces? Okay, that's a that is an excellent batch of questions because um, historically there's this been this sort of perplexing uh, thing about uh, TB when it comes to disinfection and um, you know we talk a little bit about uh, tuberculocidal disinfectants 
and these are these are designations for des, uh, disinfectants with um, a fairly strong potency. That is, they are strong chemicals, uh, and the the reason why EPA came up with that that notion of tuberculocidal chemicals is that these these disinfectants are capable of enacting uh, mycobacteria. Now, having said that, that's one thing, except that TB is not transmitted from hard surfaces. <laughs> and so that right. sort of makes it a little, little why? Anyway, but the reason why they use that, it is a measure of potency, uh, a measure of the strength of the disinfectant. Now, you ask, how is TB spread? Well, TB is basically the classic airborne uh, bacterial infection. And so it is spread, uh, again, from, the, um, from one person to the next through, again, discharge of tuberculosis bacteria into the air via aerosols and droplets and so forth. What makes TB a little bit different from influenza and, and common colds is TB can remain active when some of those larger droplets start to evaporate and you get a little droplet nuclei. Well, TB bacteria can remain active while the droplet has now turned into the nuclei state. And it can remain suspended in air indefinitely. And so consequently, you will see when, um, when you have someone with TB uh, that has not been uh, starting the treatment, the, the uh, anti-TB uh, medications, that they will be usually kept in what we call airborne isolation rooms. Because uh, just the simple act of breathing, if you are uh, very infectious with TB, TB can, can expel TB bacterium into the air. So uh, the bottom line for TB is, yes, it is an airborne disease. Um, no, it is not transmitted from uh, hard surfaces. It is more that a susceptible person is in the airspace where active TB uh, bacteria can be found. And um, if you do think that you have TB, do uh, get with your doctor right away because um, the treatment is effective, but it has to be uh, started uh, reasonably quickly. And it's very important that you complete the entire regimen of treatment. If you in any way stop early, it's, 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 it's probably why TB is still such an important disease that we need for patients to be adequately treated and uh, comply with the length of treatment. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I've got a, one more question. I think this one may be more appropriate for myself. Uh, the question is, uh, relates to hand sanitizers. Uh, hand sanitizers were mentioned a couple of times in, in today's presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is, how will FDA, and by the way, FDA regulates hand sanitizers, how will the, the recent FDA final rule on antibacterial hand washes uh, affect the use of hand sanitizers? Uh, and the, the short answer is that it won't. Uh, the rule that was issued, or at least not in the short term, uh, and let me expand on that. The, the recent rule that was issued by FDA did, did a couple of things. First of all, the, the products it was focused on are antibacterial washes, uh, products intended to be used with running water, intended to be rinsed off the hand. Uh, in that rulemaking, FDA has essentially found that the uh, common ingredients that have been used common active ingredients that have been used in those products are no longer recognized as safe and effective. And after September of 2017, will not be allowed to be used in those antibacterial hand washes. Antibacterial hand rubs or hand sanitizers, on the other hand, are not affected by that rulemaking. Uh, these are typically products that are not intended to be used with water, but while not affected now, are the subject of a separate rule and very similar rulemaking that FDA is still working on. So probably in about another eight months to 12 months, we should see a ruling by FDA 
on hand sanitizers. But as of now, uh, those hand sanitizers that are out there on the market uh, can still be used. Uh, Dr. Soholzer, I, I see that we're out of time, so I, I want to thank you once again for not only lending your time, but also your expertise to today's session. And, and thank you so much for your perseverance, even having been in an accident today. <laughs> you made it in and, and got, got a, and did a wonderful... Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. And everyone, ha have a great day. We'll be in touch with you soon. Don't forget our next webinar coming up on October 11th on the new overtime regulations. On behalf of ISSA, I wish you all a great week. Take care.